when it comes to your friendships, right, there are certain people that are going to be, it's going to be easy to run the race of life with, right? But there's going to be other people you just don't mesh well with. People that don't actually help you move forward, but actually drag you back. And, and so what I, want to get, uh, 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 what I want to get to today is the reality that when it comes to the people that we live our lives with, we need to align our lives with somebody who is going to help us. Somebody who is going to help push us forward rather than drag us back, which is much easier said than done. So how, how do you tell which relationships are actually helpful for you versus the ones that are not? And so that's really what we're going to get into today. Uh, being a teenager is, is really difficult, right? You guys have crazy busy, busy schedules. But some of you, like, I, I remember what it was like in high school. Some of you guys are even busier than I was, and I, I thought I was busy in high school, right? Some of you, you are in multiple sports, or even just one is a lot nowadays. Uh, some of you work at the same time. Uh, you, you've got family lives. You've got homework. You've got uh, time with friends that you want to spend. Like, life is busy. Life is tough. And it's really hard to get your priorities right. And it's really hard to be extra selective about your friends when so much of your schedules are set up in such a way that you have very little control over who you're spending your time with. You, when you sign up for classes at school, uh, you, you have very little control who's also in those classes with you. When you join a sport or, or a club or an extracurricular of some kind, you have very little control over who else is there. And we naturally try to be friendly with those that we're around, but if we're not intentional about the people that we spend our time with and that we are closest to in this life, that will have a, a, a major effect on how we live, right? Um, it, this, is, this is a lot like in surfing. I want to show you a little bit of a video right here. And I actually know very little about surfing, so I had to do a little bit of research, but I've got a point here. So I want you to, to check out this video clip. Here's the point I'm trying to make with that. Did you notice how massive those waves were? Anybody ever been surfing like that before, just out of curiosity? Like that? Probably nobody in this room, right? Anybody been surfing in general? How's that? There you go. So you're like, yeah. oh, no, not like that, right? I've never been surfing, period, right? But, but what you have to know about that kind of stuff, I had to find this out, was, was that you actually have to have the, the, your buddy on the jet ski position you in the right place because of how fast those waves come. You can't get out there on your own in order to ride the waves all by yourself most of the time. You have to have somebody tow you out there on the jet ski and then drop you in the right position to be ready for the wave. It actually takes a lot of practice, a lot of trust that the person is placing you where you should be when you should be. Otherwise, you'll get sucked into the wave and actually it can be kind of dangerous as we talked about last week. And so oh, the point is you have to have a lot of trust that the person that you're doing it with is somebody who, who is going to put you in the right place, put you where you need to be, when you need to be, so that you can ride the wave like you're supposed to and you don't get buried by it, right? It, the same is true in our friendships. We need that trust that our friends are going to place us in the positions we need to be in order to succeed. And you need to be able to do that for your friends as well. If you don't have that, then it's something that you can work on. It's something you can build up within a friendship. Or sometimes we just need to find new friends. Because uh, how we can know, uh, it, it can be tricky to know which friendships, right, are, are pulling us away for who God calls us to be and who's pulling us in to who God says that we are. We talked a lot about last week how God's word helps us discover who we're supposed to be. And we need friendships that will help us pull us closer to who God says we are rather than pulling us away. When I was in high school, I got, I got better at having discernment about who to spend my time with and who not to. But when I was younger, uh, middle school is when, he, when I finally started figuring this out a little bit, kind of, uh, but especially in elementary school, uh, I was a follower. Right? I did what everybody else did, and I just didn't really think a whole lot about it. I would, when we were doing stuff I knew we shouldn't do, I would get this like pit at the bottom of my stomach. I was one of those kids that was terrified of the principal's office. I was terrified of getting in trouble. And I had this like little sixth sense when I knew I was doing something I shouldn't be doing. I mean, you guys can relate. Like, and so I had a buddy of mine that, uh, that I was friends with since preschool. But you know, as we got older, our, our paths kind of split away from each other for various reasons. But when we were in like sixth grade, um, I, there, there were just times all growing up, he would, he would convince me to do things that I knew I probably shouldn't be doing, but I was too afraid to speak up about it. And uh, one of them was just prank calling people. 
he would get his mom's phone and we would just sit in his room and like, let's prank call people. And then he would dial a number and then like, if people answered, he would say something stupid and then hang up. And then I was like, this is dumb. Let's not, let's not do this. And he's like, no, it's fun. I did this with David, right? It, 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 he would say this like, I did it with other people. Therefore, you, you should do it too or you're a wimp, right? And so I just kind of sat there and went along with it, even though I didn't really participate. I didn't really stop it from happening. I was just kind of a follower. I remember one time uh, somebody didn't answer, and so he hung up, but then that number called back. And so he threw the phone out of the bedroom and pretended like he had never had it, and his mom picks it up, and the person's like, hey, they had a caller ID. This was back when like caller ID was like rare, like that people would have caller ID. And so uh, some of the adults in the back remember this time, but th they found the number and called back, and his mom came in and she's like, they hit, my buddy's name was Zach as well, so she goes, Zach, did you call this number? And he was like, oh, we, we were trying to call David. He just like straight up lied to her. And I totally like felt guilty and was like, I should say something, but I didn't. I was like, I'd rather just not get in trouble. So I just sat there. Anybody been in that position where you're like, I know we got busted, but I'm not owning up to it, right? And so another time we were in sixth grade and, uh, and we, we decided to go exploring out in the woods by his house, uh, which is always a great idea. And, uh, and so we go out there and, uh, and we, we're, we're walking around and again, sixth grade um, and easily freaked out. And uh, you gotta understand in the part of town we were at where I grew up, um, there was no shortage of drug activity and sketchy stuff happening. And uh, so we were in this like wooded area and uh, there was a clearing and, uh, and we saw what we thought was somebody holding up a shotgun like across the other side of the clearing. There were like sketchy tent tarps set up and stuff and we're like, we should not be here. And we, we started to turn around and I, I swear to you, I saw a footprint in the mud of an adult dude, a large dude that was not there when we started walking. And I like froze in my steps because I was like, somebody else is here. And, and I was freaking out and he was like probably 10 feet away from me. And I heard footsteps, but they weren't him. And I heard it behind me in the woods. So I hear the leaves. And you know, and I'm freaking out. I was like, Zach. And he's like, somebody's here, run! And we like took off as fast as we could back towards his house. Like, and I, 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 I'll tell I've never been so terrified in my entire life. We are running back. We, we jump out of the woods and like by his street and we run into his house and he goes, mom, mom, there's the dude with the gun. And we were out there and she starts like, she gets the phone. I thought she was going to be like, it's okay. It's okay. You know, you're, you don't have to worry. But instead she goes, I'm calling the police. And like, I'm thinking, oh no, this quickly got out of hand. So then like five minutes later, the police show up to his house. They start interrogating us. And they said they went back in the woods. They got our story and they were, they were radioing it to other people. They were in the woods. They ended up chasing a guy away, didn't find a shotgun, but chased him away. He went over a fence and got away. Uh, but then they put an APB out on him. They're, they're circling his, uh, uh, circulating his description, all that kind of stuff. And then the police officer sat down and he goes, so what were you boys doing out there? And uh, we were, I mean, we were pretending we were in Lord of the Rings. And we had a bunch of like knives and daggers and doing being what like sixth grade boys do. And, uh, and he, he goes, well, did you see like the six no trespassing signs on your way? And we were like, no. And I, honest to God, did not. Uh, but I knew that Zach knew. And he had dragged me into it yet again to a situation where I shouldn't have been. And, uh, and, and so we got in a lot of trouble for that. Um, not by the law, but by our parents. <laughs> because, yeah. So I learned pretty quickly at that point I gotta stop just being a follower. I'm gonna have to like stand up for myself and make my own decisions. And if he doesn't wanna be my friend anymore, I'm cool with that, right? I, I was like, I am done. I don't wanna get a record. I don't wanna run into the law. Like again, hate being in the principal's office, hate being in trouble. I felt sick for like two days after that thing. Like I, I will never forget it. it's burned into my brain. And I, I'll tell you what, I learned a very important and valuable lesson that who your friends are can pull you towards God or pull you away. Right? And, and you have to have the discernment to know what, that's, uh, what, what relationships are doing that for you and which relationships you should probably keep at arm's distance. Right? 
And I'll say right off the top, this doesn't mean you can't be friends with people who aren't Christians because that's stupid and unrealistic and you should actually be a light to people who don't know Jesus. But who you allow into your inner circle, the, the greatest levels of influence in your life, those you should pick very carefully. And uh, I, I want to uh, give a case in point here straight from Scripture. This is the very beginning uh, of John's Gospel in chapter 1. And this is when Jesus is calling his disciples. And check this out. And starting in verse 43, it says, The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. <laughs> Check this out. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Right? Come and see, said Philip. Uh, when Jesus saw Nathanael uh, uh, approaching, he said, Here. Truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still there under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Now, Jesus invites Philip to come and follow him. And what happens? Right? Philip immediately runs to his buddy, Nathanael. He goes, you got to come. And, you know, he's, he's like, oh, Nazareth. Who, what, what good can come from there? It's like, it's like saying, oh, you know. Trafalgar. What, what good can come from there, right? You say it backwards, it's raggle fart, right? And uh, that's, we say that to Rick all the time, and he, he doesn't like that. But it, it's one of those things that, like, you hear the town, and may, maybe you think, well, what, what's the if, if this was truly the one that the prophets had, had told about, he would be coming down from, like, you know, the, the capital. He'd be coming straight from Jerusalem. He'd, he'd be coming on a white horse to declare that he's the king. The prophesied, right? That's not what happens. And so Nathaniel's disbelief. He's like, ah, what good can come from that? There's nobody significant comes out of there, right? You're, you're full of it, basically. And Jesus comes and tells him something that only he would know. And he goes, oh, oh you are, right? But he never would have gotten to that point if his buddy didn't go over there and get him, right? Come and see is what he said. We need friends that will invite us to come and see what God is doing and, and not pull us away from it, right? Their, their lives change drastically from that point on. The decision the, to, to follow Jesus obviously changes the course of history. And if they had said no, Jesus would have chosen somebody else. But they said yes, and they got to witness Jesus walking the earth for three and a half years of his ministry, perform miracles, healing the sick, raising the dead, and eventually raising himself from the dead. They were able to be the leaders in the early church because of this decision. Nathaniel was able to participate because Philip came and said, hey, come and see. We need friends that when we see something good, we immediately go to them and bring them with us. You need someone that will immediately come to you and say, you got to check this out. Hey, I, I was listening to this podcast. I was watching this YouTube video. And check this out. This completely changes the way I think about this. Right? You need friends that are going to say, hey, I was, I was thinking about this. And I know you're, you're debating that decision. But you got to come listen to this. Because I feel like this will help give you clarity in your decision-making process. You need friends that are, that are going to come to you in realistic ways and say, dude, I heard this song. I was thinking about this. I was, I was thinking about you when I heard these lyrics. And I feel like this will give you clarity. Right? You need friends that will constantly point you back in the direction you should go when life's distractions are everywhere, pulling you naturally away from your calling, right? So uh, the reality is we, we need that person who is there to do that. Just like I had Zach that kind of pulled me away for a while uh, in various situations, I also was really fortunate to be surrounded by a lot of good Christian friends at a Christian school, uh, at my church, that constantly, like, the conversation of faith was not uncommon. It didn't feel awkward because, like, we had Bible class together, right? Uh, we, we, had, we had chapels together. We had been in church our whole lives together. And so these were lifelong friendships that was natural. We'd been in small groups together. It, it was natural for us to just pull each other in the same direction because we were on the same life course. Not everybody has that. And not everybody, it's that easy. If I had not had that opportunity, I, I don't know how I would have turned out because like I said, I was kind of a follower. If I had not had people in my life 
leading me in a good direction, I have no idea where I would be today. Probably wouldn't be here. And, and so we have to have people in our lives that do this for us, right? I think, I think this is uh, evident very clearly in the book of Proverbs. It's this old book of wisdom that rings true even today, thousands of years later, and uh, written by the wisest guy on earth. And, uh, and this was something that looks kind of like the mantra for my parents. They've, I've heard them talk about it several times in their marriage. Um, and, and it's this verse, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Right? Any of you into like knives or sharpening knives or anything like that? Like you, you as one, uh, you, you need both iron and the knife, right? You, to, to sharpen it. I'm losing my words, but you get, you get my point, right? The friction helps them to, to sharpen each other. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. One person sharpens another. You, do the people in your life sharpen you or do they dull you? Do, do they create friction that just blunts your momentum or do they finally sharpen you? Do they give you enough friction to not allow you to get away with things when you shouldn't, but allow that process to sharpen you in the process? We need these relationships in our life if we are going to thrive, right? There's, there's been a ton of research and studies on like uh, what, what helps, you know, how like social dynamics and stuff like that, but also uh, on students that grow up in church, graduate high school, and who remain faithful after high school. When they don't have mom and dad tell them to get to church all the time, when they're on their own, they're free to make their own decisions, what percentage stay active in their faith versus fall away, um, and, and in general, friendship dynamics. There's been lots of studies done on this, all right? And the, the information tends to point to the reality that you are the average of the five closest people you spend time with. So if you spend time with a bunch of people who, who don't pull you towards Jesus, and maybe you have one or two people that do, but you don't spend as much time with them, you're going to be the average of that. If you surround yourself, if your core group of friends are all believers, if they all, all walk towards Jesus, then even when you have conflicts in those friendships, if you work through them, if you help like lovingly try to just work through your problems and work through to solutions and understand that at the end of the day, you give each other the benefit of the doubt because, you know, we're all on the same team. If you surround yourself with people that, that do this for you, that, that are the Philip to your, new your Nathaniel, you will be the average of that. You, you will, in, in other words, your likelihood of sticking with your faith and actually growing and building on your faith is much more likely. Just like that example from the beginning with the relay race. If you get somebody who is equally yoked with you, who is, who is equally helping you, you're, you're more likely to make it much further down the road. And that's difficult. That's difficult to find. But if we're intentional about it, to structure our lives in such a way that we have those people around us, it will make all the difference because the right relationships help us discover how to grow. They don't just automatically push us to grow. They help us discover in what way specifically we are supposed to grow. Because you know what? The right friendships know you well enough to know what your triggers are. They know you enough what buttons to push to drive you nuts. Sometimes they push those buttons on purpose. But they also know what motivates you in a way that fewer people do. And those closest to you can be your best iron sharpener to help you see in your blind spots. Because the alternative is you have friends that either don't be honest with you when you're making a fool out of yourself or don't have the heart to tell you, right? You all, you all know your closest friends, your, the ones that actually care about you will tell you when you got a booger hanging out your nose, right? If they don't really care about you, they'll kind of let you go on and then you're, you look in the mirror and you're like, how long has that been there? I have no friends, nobody told me, right? Uh, your closest friends will call the snot on you, right? They, they, they will help you, and they hopefully in a loving way. But they're going to push you to grow. Friends are also going to be there to celebrate with you. And, and they're not going to push you towards relationships, towards that dating relationship, towards, towards the, the relationships that you know are just going to pull you away 
from Jesus, those friends are going to sharpen you. They're going to help you discover more about yourself because we can, we can very rarely see ourselves accurately. And so the right relationships help us discover how we need to grow in Jesus. Uh, one more video example for you, and, and then I'll, I'll move on here. Check out, check out this example. What's kind of cool is, is you, can, you can research that story, but they learn to depend on one another to work with each other. They, they organize themselves. They, they literally helped keep each other alive during that time. They shared responsibilities. Um, even when one of them was injured, they found a way to care for him together. They prayed together. I, it's pretty remarkable stuff. And the reality is, if we have friendships in our lives, that hopefully we're never in a position that extreme. But if you think about your faith journey as being something that extreme, you are on an island spiritually in this world where everything else is out to get you. The media that's put in front of you, the, the way of life and thinking when you doom scroll social media, the, the constant feed and rabbit holes of YouTube that you could go down for hours on end, the movies that we could watch, the music we could listen to. Honestly, most of us, the friends that we could be around during our everyday lives because we're just in school or whatever, most of them, most of those influences do not pull us towards Jesus. They do not push us that way. So, spiritually, we, we kind of are in this little island. And we need people who are core, core relationships in our lives who are close to us that you can band together with and have each other's backs. I want you to, to have those relationships in your life because they can be the maker or breaker of your faith, of the decisions you make, uh, of life-altering decisions that your friends can save you from. Everybody needs this. And honestly, this is why we set up our high school gatherings so that we have small group in them. When I first got here, the, there was kind of a separate structure. And this is how it was when I grew up, right? But there, was, there was youth group, and then like there were D groups separate from that. Uh, we made a very intentional decision several years ago to have small groups be a part of our Sunday evening experiences when most of you are here already so that we try to kind of help build in some community for you. That over time, over trips at CIY, over the Sunday nights, week in, week out, you build these relationships with each other that you can have this core community that has your back and best interests in mind. But that will only take you as far as you're willing to go with it. And so... Uh, that, that's why we, we have small group times, and I'm about to release you to those to spend the rest of our time together. But some points uh, to make real quick from not only their story, but from the story we find in Scripture, the stories that I've I, I found to be true in my own life, is, is one, you have to use your gifts to serve one another. If you use your gifts, your talents, your, your desires in order to only serve yourself, you will have blind spots the rest of your life that people will be unwilling to share with you because you won't have relationships that are that close to you. You have to use your gifts to serve those around you and have that mentality of others first. Secondly, spend time together. I know time is a, is a precious commodity nowadays, but if you don't prioritize time with the right people, you will fall into time with the wrong people. Thirdly, point people to Jesus. Just like Philip did to Nathaniel, come and see. There's an active part of evangelism that if we're not actually bringing other people along with us or at least trying to, then we're missing out on part of what we're supposed to be doing. And lastly, spend time with God together. It's important to have individual prayer time and individual devotional time and time that you spend with God. We talk about that all the time, but you should spend time with God with those closest to you. Those are the formative things that are going to shape you spiritually.